Thank you. I'm a, can everyone hear me? I'm a, I'm a nephrologist and I would like to spend about 10 to 15 minutes to talk about acute renal failure. Acute renal failure after Russell's Viper bite is a very common problem, as you know. Again, just like Dr. White and Dr. Alfred has just mentioned, these are guidelines. You will have very severe cases where there may be no way you can treat the patient. But these are guidelines. And I think as doctors, it's very important to do the right thing early, but it's also very important not to make the, thing, the problem worse. So one of the problems that I have heard many times is uh, through speaking to you and Dr. Tida, is acute pulmonary edema. And it may, there may be an iatrogenic component. So let's talk about this. So there are many potential causes in the, in the pathogenesis of acute renal failure after Russell, after Russell's viper bite. There are direct nephrotoxic uh, potential, and this has been shown by Dr. Worrell many years ago. In fact, the effect of the venom on reduction of GFR and in disturbance of tubular function happens very early, within about 20 to 30 minutes. And as you can understand, there is no way we can change that within 20 and 30 minutes. So there is some degree of a great difficulty, a, a great degree of difficulty in all this. But there are some other things that we can do to, if you like, ameliorate the problem first, firstly, and secondly, to try not to make the problem worse. And this is what I would like to talk about. So, volume dehydration. There may be some pre-renal factors. Vomiting in some cases can be very severe, as you know. And in some cases, it can lead to significant dehydration. And volume dehydration from whatever cause will exacerbate acute renal failure. There may be some circumstantial factors which may exacerbate the problem. For example, the patient may have been working in a paddy field on a very hot day, sweating, and the patient, after having been bitten, may have had to walk or run or cycle for one or two miles, so there will be more sweating and they are vomiting. So there are potentially uh, volume dehydration um, a factor in all this. Another cause, major cause of acute renal failure is circulatory shock. And uh, firstly, the venom, as you know, has a direct uh, effect on circulatory endothelial cells that can cause circulatory shock. Sometimes, as you have seen, severe bleeding from the GI tract, malina hematemesis can lead to shock, and infrequently, adrenal hemorrhage um, associated with adrenal insufficiency can lead to circulatory shock. Another problem in this snake bite uh, after Russell's Viper is thrombotic mic microangiopathy. And you can get a sense of this when you detect hemolysis. You can look at a blood film, there may be evidence of hemolysis, fragmented red cells, any cytosis. Um, the LDH may be high, the bilirubin may be high. If you have access to serum heptoglobin, the heptoglobin may be very low. Those are all hallmarks of hemolysis, intravascular hemolysis. There is often accompanied accompaniment of low platelet count, thrombocytopenia, and sometimes there may be frank DIC. Now those uh, observations will lead you to suspect that there may be thrombotic microangiopathy. Now how might that affect the kidneys? Well, if you have thrombotic microangiopathy, there may be clotting in the glomerular capillaries. And we know from others, uh, others, uh, other case reports um, that have been performed by uh, Dr. Pang So and uh, Dr. King Mong Tae in many years ago, uh, sometimes there may be even acute corticonecrosis in the kidney from this problem. Another problem, rhabdomyolysis. It used to be thought that the Myanmar 
Russell's viper did not cause rhabdomyolysis. We, we don't think that that may be right in 100% of cases. And uh, we have spoken to some of you, and the observation is that you can see dark urine in 10 to 15 cases, percent of cases, correct, approximately? And we wonder whether some of them may be due to rhabdomyolysis. Now, dark urine may be due to many causes. One of them is myoglobin from rhabdomyolysis. The other uh, pigment that can cause the urine to turn dark is hemoglobin, if you have um, hemolysis. So um, there is a potential for us to do a study to measure serum CK to see how many of your cases suffer from rhabdomyolysis. And rhabdomyolysis can predispose to acute renal failure as well. Very often we see patients who come in with very tight application of tonicae. Almost 70, 80, 90 percent of patients. And this is a major problem because prolonged application of tight tonicae promotes ischemia and that promotes rhabdomyolysis and in turn acute renal failure. There are other uh, uh, accompanying other problems as well that might lead to acute renal failure. Sometimes the bite from the snake itself can, in addition to venom injection, can lead to injection of bacteria from the mouth, the flora of the snake and that can lead to cellulitis and septicemia. And uh, I was speaking to uh, Dr. Mia Mia Ten, who's at the back, and she had heard, seen several cases where application of inappropriate first aid, unfortunately, from sucking and cutting and tattoo and acupuncture, sometimes can introduce bacteria, and that is another source of bacterial sepsis. And as, as happens in my hospital, and I'm sure here, unfortunately, sometimes intravenous drip sites can get infected as well. So the moment you don't have to use the drip site, please take it out. They can always be replaced. And these are rare. I know you don't use gentamicin much at all, so fortunately um, this should not happen uh, uh, commonly. Now, I do know that you do use cephalosporins a lot, and infrequently, patients who have been given cephalosporins can develop acute renal failure due to interstitial nephritis. Now, this is an idiosyncratic, uh, impossible to predict uh, problem, and rarely you can get an allergic reaction, a systemic allergic reaction with eosinophilia, so-called DRESS syndrome. Uh, I've, just, uh, I, I, I've just spent the last two hours uh, looking through some of the case records and one of the patients uh, that we had recently in your hospital had, had, had been bitten by a snake a few years ago and had in fact had antivenom a few years ago and he developed antivenom induced serum sickness and that rarely can cause immune complex glomerulonephritis. So there are many causes, probably in the order of importance of priority early and late. Okay, are there any questions on this slide alone? These are generalizations. If not, we'll move on to the principles of management. Again, these are principles. They are not applicable to every case because every case is subtly different. But there are some general comments and there are some comments relevant to early phase management and the late phase management. You need to assess the patient carefully and frequently, at least once a day, and perhaps even more than once a day, maybe two or three times a day. There are standard uh, clinical skills of blood pressure measurement, measuring the heart rate, JVP listening to the chest, looking for edema. You all know that. I won't have to say that. But as a nephrologist, I think one of the simple things you can do is to record meticulously fluid balance. By that I mean me recording how much the patient has um, had input in terms of oral plus IV, how much has come out, 
and your estimation of insensitive, uh, insensitive loss. Insensitive loss in this climate is probably at least 500 mils, and more so if there is vomiting and diarrhea. So you have to allow for that. If you have a, a, a weigh machine, a, uh, uh, it is simple, very easy to weigh the patient. And if you find that the patient is going up by from 60 kilogram to 65 to 68 kilogram, you know the patient will go into acute pulmonary edema. Um, so that is simple and uh, does not require any uh, uh, money. Urinalysis. Um, in patients with this problem, they often will have albuminuria or proteinuria. Uh, the problem, however, you might say is that you might not have urine dipsticks in your hospital. How many of you have access to urine dipstick in your hospital? Can you tell me? It, one dipstick, two, three, four. So um, only a minority has access to dipstick. As you know, dipstick measurement of the pregnant mother is important to look out for preeclampsia. So you may want to find out if you have dipsticks in your hospital. And I know this is difficult. Most of you may not be able to measure the serum creatinine, serum potassium and urea. But if you can, just like in this hospital, of course, that helps. It's important to restrict the potassium intake. For example, bananas have a lot of potassium. And if you are not sure of about um, volume status and if you're concerned about impending uh, pulmonary edema, a chest x-ray um, is uh, possible to do in most of your township hospitals, if I'm not wrong. In the early phase, you need to assess whether there has been volume loss from vomiting or excessive, uh, excessive sweating. And if so, the volume loss needs to be replaced in a timely manner without delay. Now, I would, Dr. White um, and, and I would think that uh, most adults can tolerate one to two liters of normal saline uh, safely at the start without danger of adverse effect. Uh, that, that's generally safe, one to two liters. However, this is an important point to, to make. If the patient remains oliguric, despite correction of volume loss, there is probably no point in continuing IVT. It may become dangerous to keep on pushing, giving IVT beyond that point. We will also add, and this is uh, a point that's been confirmed in discussions with uh, Dr. Kinti Tatuin, uh, the di director of nephrology in your country, there is no routine indication to give fruzamide because there is no evidence that fruzamide no firm evidence that fruzamide will prevent the development of acute renal failure. Now, if the patient has been adequately replaced and you have monitored the progress of the patient over the first one or two days, but there remains oliguric, and this is now day three, day four, we have to manage conservatively. In my hospital, we'll be measuring the serum creatinine and urea and potassium every day. That may or may not be possible in your country. Again, I emphasize giving more fluid at this stage when the patient remains oliguric and uric will lead to acute pulmonary edema, especially when the patient is at risk of capillary leak syndrome after a few days. So all you can do and there is nothing, even if this patient is in my hospital in Adelaide, Australia, there's nothing more we can do. All we can do is restrict fluid oral intake to equal, roughly equal, the previous day's urine output plus insensitivity loss. So, for example, if the previous day's urine output over 24 hours was 600 mils at 4 or 500, that's about a litre. So, you can say, all right, um, nursing staff, uh, please allow this, please limit this patient to 1.1 litres, okay? That's conservative management. Call for help early. The signs of acute renal failure are oliguria, um, anuria, 
protein in the urine, those are signs of impending of, of, of developing acute renal failure. Call for help early, transfer early rather than late. And this is really important. You must provide adequate record of fluid balance when transferring the patient to the next healthcare facility. I've seen many referral letters where there is no mention of how much IV fluid has been given. Imagine the patient went from Station Hospital to Township Hospital to Mendeley General Hospital. So at the Station Hospital, they gave three litres. They went to Township Hospital, they gave four more litres. By the time they come to you, they would have had six to eight litres and the patient is becoming <sighs> short of breath. And so it is important when you write your brief referral letter, introduce the patient, what were the main problems, why was ASV given, and also please provide a record of how much fluid was given in your facility when you transfer the patient to the next healthcare facility. Otherwise, as you can read, there is a tendency to give more IV fluids at the next healthcare facility if the patient remains oliguric, and this will lead, might lead to acute pulmonary edema. And uh, lastly, I'll finish by saying something that you all should know and do know. The traditional conventional indications for dialysis anywhere in the world is absolute indications of acute pulmonary edema, severe hyperkalemia, severe metabolic acidosis, acidosis and severe uremia. So I'll stop at that point. Um, happy to take questions.